Welcome to today's first session at the 2021 Sporting Chance Forum. Uh, this is day three. Uh, today's uh, theme or this session's theme is Building Sustainable Mega Events, a Foundation in Human Rights. Over the past 30 years, we've seen an increased focus and emphasis on the impact of sport and major sport events. Words and phrases like legacy, regeneration, carbon neutral, community benefit, ethical supply chains, workers' rights, and many more have become part of our vocabulary and in the very DNA of our sport ecosystem, and in particular, when we talk about mega events. Between 1990 and 2000, this decade, we saw a number of initiatives in sport linked to emerging social and economic trends, largely aligned to issues related to inequality, for instance, gender and disability, peace building, sport as a catalyst for peace, and urban planning, particularly focusing on sport events as a stimulus for emerging and regenerative markets. When the eight UN Millennial Development Goals, the MDGs, in two, were launched in 2000, we started to see events take on a broader alignment with frameworks and models of best practice. This is also when we started to see stronger expectations emerge around the environmental impact of hosting events. Between 2000 and 2012, a number of events aligned themselves with what we called at the time corporate social responsibility schemes on contextually thematic, meaning themes that were contextually relevant to the time, place, people, and activity that was being conducted. These initiatives were largely focused on environmental impacts within the sporting sphere, with some emphasis on social and economic benefits. The terminology of sustainable development began to emerge and become more mainstream, and the very notions of an event operating sustainably and having sustainable benefits emerged into our psyche and expectations during this time. In 2012, the creation of a new standard for the hosting of sustainable events in the event industry emerged called ISO 2012-1. The International Organization for Standardization, ISO, develops voluntary consensus-led international standards to provide solutions for global challenges. ISO 2012-1 in particular provided and provides guidance on event sustainability including the environment, social, and economic impacts of events. Between 2012 and today, we have seen a number of events, sporting and others, become certified or practice with the ISO 2012-1 standard. This is often seen as a legitimizing symbol of good, responsible best practice in establishing not only responsible event delivery, but events with a legitimate foot footprint that contribute to the protection, promotion, and enablement of sustainable development within their sphere of influence. Again, the time, the place, the people, and purpose. The launch of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals in 2015 have provided a further framework and call to action to sports to align their events with contributing to a better world and the achievement of these sustainable development goals. A proposed annex to the ISO 2012-1 standard, which offers particular guidance on the aspect of human rights and child rights, as well as safeguarding, is currently being developed and is soon to be piloted across a number of events. The creation of this annex could be another significant development for mega events hosting that offers both a pragmatic approach to addressing challenging human and child rights related issues, as well as being a platform for building greater opportunities. To discuss this standard, the proposed annex, and the importance of sustainable sport events, I am privileged and honored to be joined by an esteemed panel of expert colleagues, starting with Stefan Marinkovic, who is a technical program manager at ISO. As technical program manager, Stefan oversees the work of numerous, I believe 17, ISO technical committees, ensures projects are well coordinated on the right quality standard, developed in accordance with the ISO rules 
and delivered on time, and I assume on budget. Prior to working at ISO, Stefan worked at the UNCTAD slash WTO International Trade Center for six years. We're also joined by Tanya Braha, who oversees the implementation of the International Olympic Committee's legacy strategic approach. Before joining the IOC, Tanya has held the position of sustainability, accessibility, and legacy head of the Rio 2016 Olympic and Paralympic Games Organizing Committee. Her background combines a PhD in applied economics with hands-on experience with private corporations, local and national governments, research institutions, and NGOs in the areas of sustainability and corporate responsibility. It's great to have you here, Tanya. Next, we have Zara Grant, who is the Child Rights and Sports Specialist at UNICEF UK, where her work focuses on embedding human and child rights in sport. She is directing UNICEF UK's lead on the project to introduce human and child rights and safeguarding considerations into the ISO 2012-1 and the development of an Annex D guidance for event organizers. Prior to her role with UNICEF UK, Zara led on sport and human rights at the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. And lastly, but definitely not least, we have Julia Palais, who is a global expert on sustainability within motorsport. She is sustainability director at the world's first fully electric single-seater racing series, the ABB FIA Formula E Championship. She is also president of Sports and Sustainability International, or SNSI for short, which is an international association of sustainability experts working to broadening and harmonizing the international sport and sustainability movement. Before we jump into our questions, again, this conference is being hosted by the Center for Sport and Human Rights. So please follow us online and sport at sporthumanrights.org or on LinkedIn and Twitter at Sport and Rights. You can also join the conversation online using the conference hashtag, hashtag SCF21. We want to encourage you all to participate in the discussion, and there should be two options on the screen. One of them is a chat function where you can provide comments and share your own opinions on which is being discussed. The other allows you to ask a question. We will be taking questions from the audience after the discussion. So please pose questions throughout the session. And just before tuning in to our, our first speaker, we have a poll question we wanted to ask the audience, which will be placed uh, in the text box. The first poll question is, do you currently use the ISO 2012 one? Stefan Marinkovin from ISO. Stefan, what is the current ISO 2012 standard and where did it come from? Hello, David, and thanks for having me. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Um, ISO 2012 1 is, uh, is an international uh, standard. It's uh, the paramount type of, of uh, deliverable we have in ISO, and uh, it's it's coming from uh, our member in the UK, uh, BSI, who have come forward to us in, uh, it was uh, already in 2009 uh, that we received the, the proposal for this uh, standard. And so um, this standard is sharing some DNA with, uh, with uh, uh, well-known ISO standards like ISO 9001 or ISO 14001 in that uh, it is a management system standard um, uh, helping organization to organize their processes in order to, to reach uh, particular objectives. So it's a type of standard which will uh, look familiar to those that are already, uh, you know, practicing uh, management standards. Excellent. And how are these standards maintained and reviewed to ensure they remain, remain globally relevant? Yes, uh, well, this is... Uh, um, one of our top objectives. It's uh, not only to uh, publish, uh, develop and publish standards, but uh, to make sure they're used uh, in the market afterwards and that they 
uh, are still relevant uh, years after. So um, a standard can be uh, put up for revision at any point in time uh, by any of the ISO members or any of the 900 plus organizations that are uh, in liaison with us. Um, if nothing uh, comes up um, by from anyone, uh, there's in any case uh, what we call a systematic review, uh, which takes place uh, every five years. So we ensure that the, the, the document is still fit for its uh, purpose. Excellent. And what makes certification and implementation of these standards uh, effective? Like, I would say like any of the management standards, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not about um, um, determining the, the size of the screw or, or something tangible. It's, uh, it's about running uh, an organization and, and, and a project to, uh, to make it effective in the end. So uh, these type of things, um, particularly they, they require uh, really strong commitment and um, uh, engagement uh, from the management of, of such an organization. So um, what proves successful is when you have a management, top management, uh, which is leading the organization and which is fully behind uh, the standard and is going to dedicate resources uh, for the team who is, who is tasked with uh, implementing the, the standard. So at the end, it cannot be just a, a, a tick in a box and we have, uh, yeah, top management is needed uh, uh, throughout the, the whole life of the implementation. We have a session later today on leadership and culture within sport organizations. And it sounds like from, from your testimony that uh, you know, implementing this standard really requires good leadership and, and culture. So we can, hopefully there's some cross-pollination. <laughs> Great, well, thank you very much, uh, Stefan. Um, also, I have, I have, sorry, I have one more question for you. What is needed to conform to the requirements of a particular standard, I guess both meeting the requirements and the verification? And how's it, how does this allow for flexibility within the application of the standard, uh, I guess, across uh, uh, different locations? Well, uh, yes, uh, management system standards uh, are, are designed to be, uh, you know, uh, implementable by different types of organization, uh, different size, different, uh, uh, location, um, and so what. What matters most is that the the standard will will tell you what to do, uh, not how to do it. So you have a uh, you have some some kind of leeway as to how you'll conform to the requirement of the standard, and and as to checking whether or not you conform to it. Um, these standards are written in in such a way that um, um, it it is black or white, whether you, you uh, reach the requirements or not. And um, regarding who uh, can, uh, can testify you do meet the requirements, it, we, we leave it up to, to the market, really. We are not imposing that you have a third party uh, body coming in for checking. It can come from yourself and your self declaration of conformity or it can be an arrangement between, uh, between two contract partners. So we have you know, uh, many ways uh, of implementing the standard. So there's real contextual agility uh, by design. Absolutely, yes. Great. Thank you very much, Stefan. We're going to move on, uh, turning now to Tanya Braha from the International Olympic Committee. Tanya, what are some of the benefits and challenges linked to implementing the current ISO 2012-1 standard from your extensive experience. Hello, thank you, David. Good. Hello Good to, to everyone. Uh, I think the first point is to understand that uh, a standard, it's not a silver bullet. You get out of it what you put in it. <laughs> so it is a kind of a method, it's a roadmap. 
Um, I think the biggest advantage of uh, ISO 2012-1 in comparison to other ISOs like uh, 14,000 or 9,000, it's its flexibility. Uh, it was the, the group that created was made of people who had experience in delivering events and uh, could give enough flexibility so that uh, a very large event, a major event could use, but also a smaller event will be able to put it into practice. And I think this flexibility, it is a strong point, but can also become a challenge. Um, I think, um, as was mentioned here, leadership is key. So uh, having, uh, using ISO 2012 one, and specifically, uh, it's more effective when you have a third party certification. Uh, it helps you to get buy-in, to get attention from leadership and have something really tangible. Uh, I remember that uh, uh, from the board members, for example, we had an extensive agenda on sustainability issues, but what stick to their mind was the ISO certification. So they would always ask me when we went to present something, for example, okay, we have our uh, sustainable and responsible supply chain. We want to check some criteria to have audits on site for the mascots. They will ask, will it help us to get the ISO certification? And uh, it was interesting because it, it was kind of a leverage we have because it was easy for a board member or for a CEO an to... Point. To have this on mind, and uh, you could use this as a hook uh, to bring other important things on the table because they have so many things on their plate, like a board member who is also part of other boards. It's not their daily life, but they get this into their mind. We need to get the certification for sustainability. So we need to go and see who is actually doing the mascot to make sure that the labor conditions are good. Uh, because this is important to get the certification. Uh, so it, it was a kind of a leverage and to facilitate the conversation with the leadership, get buy-in, get them enthusiastic because they will have something tangible that they could see the certificate. Uh, I think in this area of sustainability, defining what success looks like, sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> but if you have... Uh, a certification like that with a third party endorsement because you actually have been audited by a third party, it facilitates to define successful with the, the leadership and simplify things for them uh, in a way they can understand. So it has real important... legitimacy and is really exactly. tangible. Yeah. Exactly. So, and it's to get everyone around a single objective. So we have a destination. It's like a, a compass. We know where it's north, and then we can guide them through north through different ways. Also, it keeps the thing, uh, sustainability, uh, either the economic, social, or uh, the environmental sides on the radar as we approach the event. This is a major challenge for anyone working on this uh, area of uh, social responsibility or sustainability or, or purpose, however you call it, on a major event. As close as you get from the event, the pressure amounts, the delivery, the operational imperatives come, uh, you really have difficulties to keep those things on the radar. But if you have an audit coming during the event, there is no way out of it you definitely still top on the agenda. Uh, the, uh, another uh, benefit is to create a roadmap. So it is, helps you to embed it through the whole organization on the different areas and for people to understand where they go. Uh, and here, I think there are three elements of the standard that are really crucial. It's the one on the organization context. You really need to get right 
to get the most benefit of uh, the standard. The understanding and, and of are the you saying needs, that that fosters integration? That the real yes, integration? Yes, definitely. The second is uh, the guidance you have on how you go about understanding the needs and expectations of all your stakeholders and interested parties. So it's really a good tool to do this exercise. And the third one is on issue identification and evaluation. If you get these three parts of the standard right, you can have a good scope because this is also, I would say the other side of the flexibility is good because you, you can adapt a scope, a small event can have a small scope, uh, but a major event may end up with a too narrow scope. So it's really these three parts of the events that are key. And uh, it's where I think we have a common challenge today to really embed social aspects on these crucial parts of, uh, and to have more education, more guidance, because this is another interesting part, for example, uh, that you can use your process of getting the certification as a way to facilitate engagement of the staff, the volunteers, the people working with the security of the event, with sustainability and social aspects, training and education. Uh, Excellent. So, I, I, I'm particularly interested on your third your third point as well, where you where you talk about um, you know the issue identification. I, I'm assuming that's both risks and opportunities in some cases. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Which is which is that balanced proposition, uh, yeah, which and, is uh, which is uh, I think something that we're trying to. It's not just about pure risk management, and I think particularly when we start to talk about a human rights or child rights uh, perspective. Um, you know, often the first thing that comes to people's minds is that this is just a big risk, <laughs> risk management, but there's actually huge opportunities as well. You know, when you exercise the duty of care that you're able to realize, you know, some real uh, Exactly. I, yeah, I just have been to Paris last week, uh, working with uh, Paris 2024 organizing committee, and they're using this process to advance the agenda on uh, creating opportunities of job for jobs for people who are usually with situations of long-term unemployment of exclusion from the job market. Uh, so this is the kind of interesting opportunity that you can create in a major event to bring people back uh, to the job market, people who have been excluded. And, uh, you can create um, adequate tools to do it and having something like ISO 2012 one can help you embed those tools and align everyone behind them, just a, a small example. And on the challenges, sorry, I'm getting to talking too much. Uh, just two points uh, important. I think first it's time consuming. Uh, let's not, uh, <laughs> let's be clear because you have to create a process, a roadmap, align everyone, put education and training, right? Uh, at least for the Olympic games, you can have like the, the handbooks for the certification and that help you, guide you through the audit. They have 200 pages in average that uh, you formalize what you're doing. So it is a lot of time and resources to get to this. You could do it simple, yes, but uh, I think it depends on the complexity of the event and the scope and how much you want to do. Uh, and as well, really to be attentive that uh, not get distracted by the paperwork to understand that the certification is not about the hand, the manual you create to go through the certification. It is about the people how you use this to mobilize, to engage, to train, to educate, to sensibilize uh, the people who work for the event. So, and that really goes back to that point that Stefan made on leadership and culture, you know, and that, I think that that's, you know, it becomes part of that DNA um, from what I'm hearing you say. So that's, that's very affirming uh, in, 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 in many ways. Um, I, I think you've touched on it to a degree, but I, you know, I, I'll, I, Maybe just ask one 
quick question on gaps. Do you see um, any gaps under the current standard? And I guess, you know, carrying on from that, you know, why would you say there's a need for an additional annex for say on human rights and child rights as uh, to support the overall standard? Yeah, talking about Annex, of course, uh, thinking about the work I do today that's around legacy, I think uh, uh, first gap is to think about the post games. Uh, because the, the standard is used uh, for the, the post event, sorry. Uh, it's used for the event itself. And you usually, when you go for a third party certification, you will do uh, a kind of a first certification before the event and then one during and if it's a recurring event you will uh, reconfirm your certification every time the event uh, happens uh, but uh, it could be a gap for events like the one we work with the Olympic Games that is uh, one one time <laughs> in each uh, place that uh, the standard really doesn't help you to think the afterwards. Second point uh, that's important, I think it's been better used for uh, to look at the environmental side uh, and use the less subtle for the social. I think it has to do with the practice that uh, uh, the people working on the environmental side already have with eyes on 14,000 and uh, uh, that for uh, those working on the more social area has less uh, familiarity, I would say, with this kind of tools. So I think the, the standard itself, it covers well. If you define your scope uh, and you put all the social issues. If uh, in your consultation with stakeholders, you include all the, the vulnerable and affected parties. Uh, the key here, I think it's on training education. And this is the annex where it can work to train the eye to bring those social issues inside uh, the scope that uh, of your uh, ISO uh, process. So I think this is, uh, it's very interesting to have uh, a couple of annex uh, that look more specific into topics uh, and it's the case of human rights and, uh, and child rights where you can make sure that you use this tool that is the ISO in a way that your scope is comprehensive enough to uh, take everything that's important for uh, these topics. I think half the battle is demystifying it, and this may be a way of demystifying some of these uh, points, but then also knowing which questions to ask. Exactly. And I think that that's, you know, uh, ignorance is bliss, but it also comes to bite you if you, <laughs> if you don't know the questions. But thank you so much for, um, your wonderful intervention and uh, and uh, really your experience and perspectives are really valued. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move on to uh, uh, Zara uh, Grant from uh, UNICEF UK. Um, and you're working on uh, this annex and have been closely working on this. Uh, you've also worked uh, very closely with a uh, national human rights institution as well. Um, and and between the public and private and uh, sectors. So you have a lot of perspectives uh, uh, to, to share with us, Zara. What are the main elements uh, put forward by this new ex annex that you're working on? Yeah, well, thank you, um, David, first of all, for the privilege that it is to be here um, to participate in this discussion. And yeah, it's really timely and it's it's great to join um, a set of really brilliant panelists um, and hear kind of their experience so far. I'm just gonna give a one minute kind of context on uh, UNICEF UK's work on sport and kind of why we're um, working on this particular issue. Um, so more than for more than a decade, we've been working um, to use sport to um, help change children's lives for the better. So that's kind of, um, 
but ensuring that children can enjoy their right to take part in sport in a safe and enjoyable environment, meaning that um, we're ensuring that children's well-being and their safety and best interests are central to sport um, and that mega sporting events hosts um, deliver on their responsibilities to adopt a rights respecting culture um, with the systems and expertise in place to facilitate access to remedy um, and that children and their families are empowered to understand their rights in the context of sport. Um, and to be able to meaningfully participate. Um, so that's my little spiel on kind of uh, the context of why we're working on this. Um, but yeah, in terms of the key elements, we, we recognize the absent, absence of um, human and child rights and safeguarding from the standard. Um, and so since that, we've been working alongside Positive Impact Events, which is a sustainable event management consultancy uh, based in the UK, which was involved in drafting the original uh, ISO 2012-1 standard um, so we've worked with them to kind of rectify um, that absence. Um, so our solution was to develop uh, proposed changes to the standard to incorporate those three elements um, and as well as that um, to develop an, a guidance document on how to implement those changes. So the guidance document is named Annex D, um, which complements the existing annexes A through C um, within the standard currently. Um, and the document has the potential to ensure that the majority of events across the globe, large and small, uh, sport and non-sport related, incorporate these crucial elements into their event planning. Um, so just to look at the elements a little bit more detail, within the Annex D guidance, we've included an explainer on human and child rights and safeguarding, because that's something that a lot of the time we take for granted in the human rights world um, and include reference to the UN human rights treaties, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights um, and organisations responsibility to respect human rights and do no harm, um, as well as the ILO conventions. So the guidance kind of homes in on several really important pieces that are crucial for event organizers to get right. So I'll just look at three of those. Um, first of all is stakeholder engagement that we've already touched on. Um, so Annex D emphasizes the need for event organizers to consult with both internal and external stakeholders um, throughout each stage of the event from beginning to delivery to legacy. Um, and it highlights the need to engage with experts on human and child rights and safeguarding and affected groups in particular, um, including children and those at risk of safeguarding related harms. Um, and crucially, we've also included kind of a step-by-step -step process on engaging with children effectively and ethically. And kind of the feedback that we've got so far in this consultation suggests that that part on stakeholder engagement has been really valuable because um, a lot of the time event organizers might not be sure on where to begin on that. Um, and then next, the Annex sets out the need to draft clear and robust policies on human rights and safeguarding and list the key characteristics um, of an effective policy. So there's a huge emphasis on the implementation of human and child rights and safeguarding being the responsibility of everyone rather than being down to one or two event staff to oversee. So sometimes you find that safeguarding human rights leads will be brought in kind of halfway through the planning of an event, but um, it's kind of placing that emphasis that those need to be considered right at the start and um, responsibility of everyone. And then the, the last key element that I'll kind of just run through um, is just conducting a human rights impact assessment um, to, to assess how the event from conception to legacy um, has potential or actual impacts on people and their rights. So that involves things like mapping um, your your organizers activities and um, the partners and kind of how you acquire goods and services um, and assess whether they are likely to contribute to adverse human and child rights impacts. So hopefully that's a, a whistle stop tour of, of what the, the Annex D guide is. That's great. I, th I think you've, you know, I think you've definitely uh, given a great overview of the kind of the main elements, but also some of the changes you're you're looking to make to some of the existing standards in terms of uh, strengthening or, or enhancing uh, enhancing uh, the standard. Uh, I guess, you know, what, in, in terms of this process, uh, and, I, and I think Stefan uh, and Tanya both uh, emphasize both the contextual agility of this and, and also um, the evolutionary uh, element to this. How do you see the next steps uh, in terms of consulting on this annex? And obviously this being an important, I think, puzzle to the, the social context of the standard. Uh, and why is it important uh, for sporting federations, for example, those who are essentially the, the, the major event owners uh, to be involved in this? 
Yeah. Um, well, overall, our aim is that the, the standard will be um, amended. Um, so I'll just talk through kind of what that process will look like. But um, and then going forward, our, our ask will be that event organizers incorporate that NXD into their um, planning of events. So today's session, I don't think could be more perfectly timed um, as we're currently in the middle of that consultation on the NXD guidance. And it's not too late for those in the audience to get involved. So um, definitely get in touch through the center um, or um, get in touch with me after this. But um, so currently we have shared uh, the draft Annex D guidance with sports bodies, uh, organizing committees, and crucially with other human and child rights and safeguarding experts. Um, and we've begun collating their feedback um, on the content of the Annex. Um, it's really in everybody's interest, uh, I think, to feed into this guidance and um, to ensure that it's as comprehensive and as accessible as possible. And we want to ensure that it, it can be easily translated um, by event organizers across sport, business, and other sectors so that um, they're best equipped going forward. Um, and then parallel to that consultation that we're currently running then, um, we're pil piloting the Annex D with um, actual sporting events over the next year. So that's really exciting to kind of see how this guidance is applied in real time. Um, so one of those partners will be the Birmingham 2022 Commonwealth Games. Um, and we heard from that team yesterday. So we're really pleased to be partnering with them um, on this. And we're kind of checking in with them to see how um, they're finding the guidance and kind of feedback um, as they go along, which is great. Um, and then after that, we'll plan to present um, the amendments that we've drafted to the ISO 2012-1 uh, standard to ISO, um, as well as the Annex D guidance um, in early 2022, um, ahead of its review. So the timing of the whole process is really critical. Um, and these standards, as Stefan will point out, um, are only reviewed every five years. So um, yeah, so that, that's where we are, David. And um, yeah, look forward to Great. hearing from Julia as well. Thank you. Thank you, Zara. Um, and finally, uh, again, uh, last but not least, uh, turning to uh, Julia Palais from uh, uh, Formula E. Um, Julia, you have a ton of experience uh, in, in implementing the standard, uh, slightly different than uh, uh, maybe the, the mega event of the Olympics and so forth, but bringing this on the ground consistently across a series or, 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 or almost a league, if you will. Um, uh, why is sustainability in the ISO standard a priority for Formula E? Thanks, David, and hi, everyone. First of all, thank you for, for having me. Um, well, definitely for us, ISO is, is extremely important, and uh, I very much kind of like, uh, uh, think that the, the fact that Formula E has been created on a purpose and not to be another racing series uh, really kind of like echoed very strongly in us deciding at the very early stages of the championship to adopt ISO 2012-1. And, and really, kind of like ISO is used as the backbone of our sustainability strategy so that we make sure that everything that we do is, kind of like is done according to the top international standard as, and align kind of like, uh, to, to the standard. It's reflected in uh, I mean, everything that we do in terms of our operations, but also echoing to what has been said before, it's really been used as a tool to uh, change and enhance the sustainability culture within the organization. So just to be kind of like very concrete and very tangible, um, I mean, the let's say the Bible to organize our events that is kind of like passed, uh, I mean, onto the 12 different teams every season that organize uh, events in different locations, if different countries, different geographies. Uh, I mean, the ISO standard and the way we've implemented it is completely reflect, reflected through these documents. And at the same time, we've been engaging literally with all the internal departments within formerly organization, all the different teams, all the different partners, all the key stakeholders that we've been mapping out um, regarding the ISO process and how sustainability kind of like, uh, in terms of needs and expectation was reflecting in, kind of like, uh, in their views. Um, so it's, it's really something that, uh, I mean, for us, it's, it's not kind of like a one-off. And that's why kind of like, it's very interesting what Tanya was saying you really kind of like you make the most of the standard de depending on the scope that you decide to take and uh, it's going to become the fourth year that the championship is operating under kind of like third party verification and certification for 2012-1 and it's a recurring uh, certification so three times a year and we deliver roughly 15 events a year we are audited so it's an ongoing process and certainly there's a level of maturity and evolution that we've seen throughout uh, i mean or kind of like a let's say, kind of like, oh, or marriage, let's say, with 2012-1 in, in this organization, because obviously, kind of like, 
after every season, we try and grow the scope and, and obviously kind of like the legacy because it's kind of like, an, uh, kind of like a sort of running and ongoing uh, um, way of implementing the standard is completely part of it. But I totally get that it's very much kind of like a, it's probably one of the points that we need to make sure that uh, are consistently, uh, I mean, uh, used and adapted in the standard because indeed, because you decide your own scope, you could decide that it's something that you're not really looking at. Uh, this is something that we do because this is the holistic approach that we want to take for, uh, for our events and to really kind of like uh, make sure that uh, people understand that we're really delivering on our mission. Is, do, you, do you feel that, uh, I think this is a, uh, I guess a side question to, the, to, this, uh, to this initial question, do you see your guidance, uh, you know, these guidelines um, that you're, you're putting out every year, do you see those, some of those points of guidance becoming obligations, um, do you, you know, in, in terms of not just contextual guidance, but okay, this, we've realized that this is a critical success factor and now we're making this as an obligation, um, and that, and that's there's a big difference between between that because yes, you know, obviously yes. that contractual obligation has has teeth, the focus and promise of the certification has teeth, but you know so it's a, it's a, it's almost carrot and stick. <laughs> in Absolutely, some and it's it's very important. Again, uh, the approach that we take is always starting with a collaborative approach, and then kind of like holding hands, making it then kind of like a requirement. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going kind of like to just going to give two very concrete and tangible examples. The first one is the supply chain, um, and for us again, uh, considering that we deliver roughly 12 events over six months every year since seven years, imagine the, the complexity of the supply chain for for our organization. We have thousands, tens of thousands of suppliers all over the world in different locations. So we work with suppliers to make sure that uh, I mean sustainability and ISO requirements are embedded contractually in, like, uh, in, in the contracts and so on. But we want to do more because we know that like, you know, signing up to the sustainability policy is a, is a nice to have, but how really is it, is it gonna impact them like, and the way they work? Not much, I mean, let's, let's face it. So we try and work each time with the key local suppliers or the key global suppliers that, uh, that can, like, you know, are gonna have a more virtuous impact in, um, I mean, trying to understand how they can enhance their sustainability projects and services to us, and also for them to understand what we're expecting so that we constantly grow the scope of sustainability within the championship. And we've kind of like, we started with some of them by having kind of like a, a very collaborative conversation until the point of now implementing a KPI where 20% of their remuneration, if the KPI on sustainability is not fulfilled, they won't be paid. Amazing. That's amazing. Uh, I think that's a really that's very progressive uh, in that in, in that approach in terms of tie, a tying uh, benefit. Do you, on the other side, do you see an incentive uh, other than I guess the penalty <laughs> penalty clause? It, you Absolutely. know, is there if they go beyond? Do you think that that would emerge in that that space in terms of creative we contracting? We've seen a, a very interesting kind of like a cultural shift within kind of like the, the supply chain because I think they, they all realize that it's also very much in their interest. Obviously, I think they want to continue working with us. That's uh, the first thing. But also they, they understand that it becomes for them a competitive advantage that they can kind of like, uh, sell to other clients in the market. Um, I'm, kind of like, uh, I'm going to give an example of one of our suppliers for our cars. Uh, which is kind of like a very important supplier to us because the, the car is really the heart of what we do. And we've been doing extensive work to enhance the sustainability credential of the car itself uh, that will be revealed next season. And uh, I mean, this supplier has completely changed at company level, the way they approach sustainability, implementing carbon measurement uh, for kind of like their entire business, implementing programs uh, that are linked to business development for the reuse and the recycle of the project and so on. So they've understood, they kind of like, they've, they've taken these kind of like, uh, I mean, new requirements that we were having as a real kind of like opportunity to differentiate themselves from the other competitors in the market and actually attract new, uh, new customers because they are kind of like, they are having a unique knowledge that they can then kind of like sell Again, that's where sustainability is really about the, the three pillars to, to other clients that will ultimately enhance the wider industry level in terms of sustainability knowledge and practices. So real value, a real value proposition all around, not only in terms of just positive brand reputation, but also tangible business solution as well in terms of promoting 
you know, Absolutely. You know, you know uh, economic benefit as well. Uh, what what advice would you give to other sport bodies looking to certify uh, their events in line uh, with the standard? So, I mean, I would very much echo what Tanya said. This is this is a very serious commitment that uh, that kind of when you start your journey, this is something that you need to take kind of like very seriously. It will require resources. It will require time. But ultimately, once you get kind of like in the kind of like a, in the heart of of the process, this brings so much value to an organization that is really embracing the process. Because not only can like you get kind of like a, the leadership team that really can like understand you know the the standard the certification part they they won't go probably into the nitty and gritty of kind of like a, uh, I mean the, the 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 processes but what they see is that kind of like the organization is going to become more resilient is going to kind of like uh, enhance its brand credibility and legitimacy when again it's an organization that has quite at the heart or at the core sustainability. And, and again, kind of like from the, kind of like the uh, I mean, different stakeholders, starting with your own staff and kind of like departments, you operate a complete cultural uh, change because, I mean, suddenly, uh, I mean, these people that were seeing sustainability as kind of like, you know, the next layer of their to-do list, they take it really at the heart because they really understand what is the benefit for them. Because first of all, this is kind of like a new way of approaching things. And kind of like as human beings, most of us are really kind of like excited by a new challenge and something that is, is I mean, let's say it in a very cheesy way, is, is going to do something for the greater good. Um, but ulti- ultimately, uh, I mean, is, it triggers a lot of kind of like innovative uh, practices and, and processes. And again, that contributes to kind of like having a more agile uh, business that as we've seen, is able to react and operate better in a very kind of like um, could, bumpy Couldn't context. be more relevant, exactly. <laughs> oh, excellent. Um, one final question for you. Okay, Formula E will be the first you know, uh, motorsport to embed uh, this, uh, th- this new annex and now partnering with UNICEF UK uh, also. Um, you know, in terms of the needed sustainability culture within the organization. You know, could you just maybe one more point on that? Can you really stress how important that is and, and how is that how is that going to happen? I mean, I think your, your answers have been, it, you, and, and your enthusiasm certainly show um, and your experience and, and practice show that this is part of your DNA, but can you talk a little bit about that? Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, first of all, obviously, I'm like uh, very proud to, I mean, to to have been the first motorsport to implement ISO 2201. And again, more to show the way that I'm like it, it was something possible for motorsport, because obviously there was some sort of, I'm like, you know, uh, I mean, expectation that motorsport and sustainability were not really working I'm like hand in hand. Uh, and and secondly, and probably most importantly, even more, uh, the, the partnership that we've developed with UNICEF uh, uh, regarding uh, the, their climate work, we are the biggest partner in the sports uh, uh, world uh, to UNICEF regarding uh, the climate change work that is being conducted uh, globally. So it, it's something that really is uh, is central to what we do, and and that drives me back to this cultural shift. So, uh, I mean, for Formula E uh, being kind of like a sport that has been created to advance electrification on the streets and not to be a new racing proposition sustainability and, and ISO 2201 being, again, the backbone of what we do in terms of uh, sustainability and culture is, is the heart, is, kind of like, is, is we call it the racing and reason. The racing is, kind of like a, is the, in a way, kind of like the vehicle, pun intended, that we use to pass on the message of sustainability and how people can, can, can actually live more sustainable lifestyles that are not going to be necessarily kind of like a compromise to what, what we know in terms of from like lifestyles today. So trying to make people understand that you can get the thrill, you can get the excitement, but it's not necessarily gonna, gonna be less. So going back to the cultural shift, uh, I mean, I'm now uh, uh, in, kind of like, in a wonderful kind of like, uh, moment uh, within Formula where all the department leads uh, are coming to me and saying, how can we do much? Uh, I lead uh, the department that is in charge of the branding on our, on our events. And I want to make sure that I push the barrier that we keep reusing as much as we can, that the branding is going to be recyclable, uh, that we will be kind of like flying less and less, uh, I mean, uh, material when we talk about freight and our uh, logistics partner, but we will be kind of like using more boats and so on. So 
it's really kind of like how a business suddenly kind of like takes sustainability as kind of like, a, a, I mean, everything is going through the lenses of sustainability and coming from the top management to the more operational, uh, I mean, uh, departments. That's really how kind of like uh, the, the trickle down from the pyramid, from the pyramid top to bottom is, uh, is having sustainability, uh, I mean, front and center in their preoccupation and, and how they can do a good job and deliver better events. Thank you very much, uh, Julia. Fantastic. We, I, I'm, I'm being prompted to, to announce uh, th the results of the first poll. Um, we had, uh, so the first poll, uh, in terms of how many of you are using uh, the ISO standard, we, we have 20% said yes, 40% said no, and 40% said not sure. So an interesting, um, an, an interesting uh, result. Um, hopefully by next year we'll have sixty percent saying yes, and uh, and then uh, hopefully uh, forty percent saying uh, not sure. <laughs> okay, excellent. Um, there's another poll. Thank you all, and then we'll go to questions. We'll have uh, poll question number two is recognizing that your event may be required to consider human and child rights and safeguarding in the future, would you be interested in having a say in the Annex D consultation? And this is yes, no, or not relevant for me. Okay. So please, uh, if you can, um, answer that poll. Uh, going on to some, some questions. And, uh, I have uh, one question uh, for you, Tanya. Um, Recognizing that uh, Paris, uh, you know, you've had, I think every Olympic games really since London 2012 um, has been implementing the, in the standard and, and certainly with the good work that you've undertaken in Rio, um, it's, it's now becoming um, really a standard as part of Paris 2024. I know that uh, the guidelines, particularly around human rights and so forth, um, have been embedded into the, the host, host contract. Um, how do you see, uh, you know, I guess um, the requirement for host cities moving forward, uh, you know, in terms of the good work that Paris is uh, is conducting, you know, is there is how how is your work uh, now being influenced by uh, this, I guess, call for 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 more social awareness, and do you think uh, the social media and I guess our digital connectivity is influencing uh, that call to that kind of that call to action of the uh, so the social sustainability side converging more with the the traditional, as we'd say, sustainable environmental sustainability side. It's a lot of questions into one. <laughs> 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 Let's see where I can start to, to answer. I think let, let's start with this. It's a big these. question. <laughs> yeah, it's a big question. Uh, yeah, I think the first point really interesting, and this is the direction we're going, is to integrate more uh, the three, I would say, uh, classical aspects of sustainability, uh, the environment, uh, the economic and social uh, they don't really work when you treat those things separately. <laughs> so the way to go is towards more integration uh, because there are many things that we do. For example, there is a lot of uh, among the priorities or the moment you would say, yes, climate is definitely one, but you can't think about client, climate and resilience without looking at the social and economic aspects of it. So it's all <laughs> uh, integrated anyway, or supply chain that is really a big uh, and circular economy. Uh, it's a, a, a huge priority for us. And uh, again, you cannot look at uh, your uh, sustainable supply chain as your circular economy strategy. If you come only from an environmental perspective, the social side, and the economic side of it, uh, you, you have to balance these things always. So I think the trend is towards more and more integration uh, for um, 
the years to come. And social media, that's a, I think it's a difficult question. It's not really my area of expertise, but from a user point of view, a citizen, I think it's a double sword, <laughs> double edged sword, uh, kind of, uh, because at the same time that it facilitates engagement, it increases distraction and sometimes make it hard to focus on the important. And uh, yeah, it, it's too much uh, on the, I would say you stay too much on the surface. And yeah. for some things we need to do to have a real impact on uh, social, we need to go more deep into some conversations and social media sometimes make it harder. Thank you. Thank you for thank you for answering the difficult question. It's it's, uh, it's probably the uh, conveyor of the message. <laughs> um, we have we're we're at our last three minutes. All of you have given some fantastic, comprehensive, uh, you know, just perspectives on a I think really uh, an important and emerging area. Uh, I'm going to give you each one uh, probably one minute to 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 to, to wrap up um, and give any final uh, closing statements. I think one of the important points that I think uh, all of you you've touched on it is the importance of stakeholder engagement and how that can be done um, effectively. So I guess in your, I'll give you each about 30 seconds to wrap up uh, starting Stefan, uh, since we, uh, we started with you, I'll start with you again and then I'll work through Tanya, Zara and then finish off with uh, Julia. Stefan, uh, any closing comments? Yes, thank you, David. Uh, I, I think I would like people to uh, go away uh, with with this in mind that um, this ISO standard is is a uh, hundred percent uh, scalable so we've heard about big events and uh, certification that is uh, certainly needed to 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 get uh, the legitimacy and and uh, and uh, a good good uh, good image for for all the uh, players out there but uh, small events uh, would also benefit in in buying this uh, standard and perhaps not implementing 100% of the requirements, but pick and choose what makes sense for them. So this is a, this is a really nice tool, as, as um, you know, your guest speaker said, uh, uh, starting the, the, the event this week, um, uh, ISO is a tool. Uh, your dear sociologist uh, mentioned that, and we have a huge toolbox. Uh, ISO standards is one of these many tools. And I would uh, finally invite people to, um, Type in 2012-1 in our uh, search engine in, on ISO.org, and you'll see that we have a fantastic case study about the organization of uh, COP21 in Paris uh, using this standard, as well as a, a, a nice little brochure to help them understand what the standard is all about. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Stefan. Um, Tanya, closing, closing remarks. Yeah, I think it's... Uh, I will go for... Um, ISO, it's very useful as a tool, and uh, but I think the main key point when we talk about human rights, child rights, uh, it is to really carefully do stakeholder consultation and define the scope. I think if you do a good job on these two areas to get the right people around the table uh, so that you can be very inclusive <laughs> of uh, all the possibly impacted, affected people and explore opportunities and you draw the scope for your eyes uh, with uh, this consultation process, uh, you, you can go really very uh, far on, on this journey. Great. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Zara. Uh, yeah, I'll just use my last minute to kind of plug the consultation um, and definitely get in touch. I think maybe Lucy shared my email address, but definitely on Tanya's point as well. Um, that stakeholder engagement piece is really um, key to the, the Annex D that we've written. And um, yeah, just really, I think in sport, there's more and more emphasis on inclusion 
and um, the impact that sport can have on those marginalised and um, groups at heightened risk. So that's something that we really focus on um, in the Annex D guidance and kind of have a look at the potential impacts as well, just to, to really guide um, sport events and, and other event organisers um, as well as we can, because we're we're on your side trying to assist you in this. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's all I'll say, but thank you, David. Thank you, Zara. And last but not least, uh, Julia. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll close with a perspective on COP26 that is coming up in, in just a couple of weeks now, where obviously kind of like world leaders and kind of like, uh, I mean, all organizations playing a serious role in sustainability are going to gather. And we all know that this is to try and kind of like discuss how we're going to tackle the next nine years to really kind of like, uh, get to the challenge of more or less cutting by 50% the emissions globally. And I want to remind that, I mean, obviously the challenge is, uh, I mean, environmental, but if you don't get the people to buy in the challenge to really benefit from these changes, you will never get anything sustainable kind of like in, the, in the first in instance of, of the term. So you need to put people at the center to make those radical changes that are not always gonna be so painful, uh, but uh, I mean, it needs to benefit them if you want something really long lasting, uh, I mean, for like uh, for our lifestyles and and on and most importantly for the way we know life on earth at the moment thank you so much julia thank you all uh, i'll give a shameless plug uh, to uh, our new strategy convergence uh, 2025 um i think all of you have uh, you know really emphasized the importance of uh, a people-centric approach to sport but also having that institutional focus um, and none of us can do it alone and I think it's really important. I think what uh, the ISO standard with good leadership and the right culture uh, helps us do is to deliver a fantastic sport that we can all be proud of. So um, really uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege. And I say that uh, most sincerely uh, to, to, to be able to moderate this, uh, this panel. Um, and I really look forward to working uh, with all four of you um, in the future on future events and continuing to strengthen and push forward uh, sport. Um, next up on the 2021 Sporting Chance Forum schedule is rights of the child athletes and when does participation risk being exploitive. So please do join us for that next uh, session or other sessions uh, that you have time for. Thank you all and uh, have a fantastic day.